Hello and welcome to the first lecture of Fundamentals of Circuit Design as part of Circuit Insights. What I would like to talk to you about in the next half an hour is the what, why, and how of electronic circuits. My name is Ali Sheikh Islami, and I have been a faculty member at the University of Toronto for the past 20 years. I love working with circuits, and for fun, I write Circuit Intuitions, an article series for undergraduate students in the Solid State Circuit magazine. So here's the outline. I will tell you what is electronics. I give you my definition, why we use electronic circuits, what is their purpose, and how electronic circuits achieve their purpose, and then a summary. And let me make a confession here. When I was going through the undergraduate program, I did not know the answer to any of these questions. But hopefully by the end of this lecture, you will be far ahead of me at this stage. We are surrounded by electronics today, much more than we were 30 years ago. Today, electronics are in home appliances, in your cell phones, laptops, shoes, cards, cars, hospital equipments, and in the space exploration. You are all billionaires today in a sense that you probably have billions of transistors in your pocket, in your cell phone. Electronics is everywhere. And as one of my colleagues, Professor Bram Naota, mentioned in one of his recent articles, the only place where you cannot find electronics today is in toilet paper. But that too may change with time. So to explore this world of electronics, let's briefly look inside a cell phone. You may have heard Jared Zerby from Apple earlier today talking about the iPhone and the electronics that it includes. I would like to use this image taken from the web that shows the electronic components in an older version of iPhone. There are many microchips inside the iPhone, but what I have highlighted here are the memory chips. There are SRAM, DRAM, flash memories, we use electronics to store information. There are components in your cell phone that process information for you. These are application processors, as shown here, and digital baseband processors, shown here. And then there are components that help us communicate information. These are transceivers that help you send and receive emails, power amplifiers to make sure your signal can reach the base station, GPS for navigation, and audio codec to turn your voice to bits and vice versa, touchscreen controllers to translate your touch to information, display interface to turn the information inside the memory to something you can see, turning zeros and ones to a beautiful image you have stored. So if you want to categorize all components within a cell phone, the vast majority of them, as highlighted here, fall into one of three categories. These are memories, that is devices we use to store and retrieve information. There are processors, devices to process information. And there are communication devices, allowing communication to us and to other electronics. It is interesting that this same category of devices exists in almost all electronic applications, although with different proportions. Let us look at the contactless smart card as another example. This is a picture of a contactless smart card. The electronics are invisible to the eyes. I am sure our attendees from Japan recognize this image as they are using it every day to ride the train to ride the subway, or to purchase items from grocery stores. This card, which operates without a battery, includes a non-volatile memory chip to store or update your balance every time you use the card to ride the subway or purchase an item. It also includes a processing unit, both for encryption and decryption of your data and simply to read from the memory or to write into it. 
and it includes communication devices. But unlike the cell phone, the communication is not with us. It is with the card reader through a wireless connection. So we can see two seemingly different applications require the same type of devices. In this case, we also need devices to extract energy from the communication signal in order to allow the card to work without a battery. OK, so let me do a quick recap here. Everything we said so far is about information. What is information? Information is a bunch of bits. It's a bucket of bits, as shown here. The presentation slides that you see right now on your screen, the voice you hear right now, my voice, have been translated to bits stored in memory and are being processed and communicated to you at this very moment. As we said, in all applications, we need to store information, like taking a picture or recording someone's voice, process information, like removing the red eye from a photo or adding watermark to it, and communicate information, such as sending data from a memory to a microprocessor, or sending email to your friend. Information can be, of course, in analog form, like a function of time, as shown here. Our real world is indeed analog. What we say, what we see is analog, and we need to interface to the real world. But analog information is hard to store, sometimes difficult to process, and it is more prone to error in communication. OK, I think I'm now ready to give you a definition for electronics. Here it is. Electronics is the art of controlling electrons for one of three purposes, to store information, to process information, and to communicate information. Remember, we do not have to use electrons in order to do any of these tasks. In fact, I will show you in the next slide that we can use water to do the same. We can use other material to do the same. But electronics use electrons to do all of these. And it does it at such an incredible speed and precision and at such a low cost and energy that we all enjoy today. So let's see how we could store information if we decide not to use electrons. We can store one or zero simply by writing on a piece of paper. In fact, we have been doing this for ages since our ancestors learned how to write. Alternatively, we could use a piece of metal and designate it to represent a one when it is straight and to represent a zero when it is bent. Another means to store zero or one is to simply use a glass of water. A glass full of water can represent a one and an empty glass can represent a zero. Let us take this last example a bit further. What happens if we put our full or empty glass, one or zero, outside overnight? The water may actually evaporate during a hot night, turning a one into a zero. Or if it rains overnight, then an empty glass may become full of rainwater by the morning, turning a zero into a one. In both cases, an error has occurred. This is what we call volatile storage. The information we store can evaporate over time. So the question is, can we do better with water? In other words, what would you do to maintain this volatile information over a longer period of time? Let us explore some options on the next slide. Here are some options. Use a larger glass to hold more water. Perhaps use a taller glass, or a wider glass, or just a glass with bigger volume. Option number two, use two glasses, one as a backup. Just in case something goes wrong with one, you can always refer to the next one. Option number three, seal the glass, so there will be no leakage. In fact, why not use a water bottle instead, where you can put a cap on top and protect the water. Number four is a bit more interesting. It says that we can use 
one glass, just use one glass, but then look at its water level every minute. If the glass is almost full, but perhaps not completely full, then fill it up to the top, and then come back a minute later and repeat. This way, you will maintain a good solid one all the time. If the glass is empty or almost empty, then just empty it completely and then come back a minute later and repeat. This feels like a full-time job. You need to hire someone to look at your glass of water every minute. This may sound crazy and perhaps too expensive, but you agree that is an option. The last option is to use a different shape of glass. For example, you can make the top very narrow, not to allow much rainwater to get inside, but at the cost of taking time to fill the glass when you need to. I would like to give you a few seconds to think about these options and choose your favorite method. Is it larger glass, two glasses, sealing the glass, level monitor, or a different shape of glass. You know, this is a great quiz question because everyone gets it right. All of these options are indeed great and can help maintain the volatile information over a longer period of time. But you may be surprised to know that today, when we use electrons, not water, we mostly rely on number four. But before I tell you why, let us first see how we use electrons instead of water and how our electronic glass may look like. We use electrons instead of water. We use a capacitor instead of glass, and we use transistor like water valve to allow the flow of electrons. This is in fact the basic one transistor, one capacitor DRAM cell. The storage capacitor is typically 30 femtofarad, that is 3 times 10 to the minus 14 farad. If we use a power supply that is 1 volt, then the charge on the capacitor will be around 30 femtocoulomb, which is the charge of approximately 187,000 electrons. Like the glass of water, the stored charge or electrons actually leak away through the leakage of the access transistors. And in fact, we need to monitor the voltage level, same as the water level, of these capacitors once every 100 milliseconds. Every capacitor in your 1 gigabit DRAM is examined every 100 millisecond to either fill it up or empty it. This is happening in your cell phone every 100 millisecond. How about a non-volatile storage? Let's see that on the next slide. The transistor shown here has a floating gate that can trap electrons. The floating gate is fully isolated and we need a special mechanism called hot electron injection to get the electrons there and to take them away. You can think of this as a capacitor of different shape where the right mechanism is different than the erase mechanism and different than read mechanism. You can also think of this as a bottle holding electrons with a cap not letting them escape. Okay, let us now see how we can use electrons to process information. On the left, we have an input signal, a function of time, shown as x of t. And we would like to process this signal to remove its high frequency component through this transfer function. We can represent the function x of t with a voltage source, essentially bring a source of electrons to the input node and allow these electrons to go through a resistor and charge up the capacitor or discharge the capacitor, and in doing so, perform the exact processing we wish them to perform. We are employing electrons to do this processing 
for us. The case of digital processing, shown on the right, is even more interesting. We create a voltage at the input with a bunch of electrons and then influence a different bunch of electrons at the output node, creating an output voltage doing any of the logical operations that you wish to perform. How do we use electrons to communicate? This slide shows communication through a wire. There is a transmitter and a receiver separated by a wire or a cable. The transmitter translates bits 0 or 1 to their corresponding voltage at this node. In this example, the voltage of the transmitter corresponds to two ones followed by a zero. The voltage of these nodes are actually determined by the number of electrons at this node. As the voltage of this node goes up and down, the corresponding number of electrons at this node goes up and down, and a wave propagates along the wire from left to right, without electrons themselves moving much along the wire. This is very much like a water wave that can carry energy on the surface of a lake without the initial water traveling with the wave. This voltage waveform is damaged and bruised by the time it reaches the receiver, even though the receiver may be only a few centimeters away. This is again similar to a water wave losing its strength as it arrives at the shore. The job of the receiver is now to use electrons to process this voltage waveform to retrieve the original information. The equalizer here compensates for the channel loss, followed by clock and data recovery circuits. We could also communicate information with a wireless channel through the air. Again, we use electrons at the transmitter to prepare a current for the antenna, creating a wave that will propagate from the transmit antenna to the received antenna. We then use analog signal processing to extract the useful data. The three main building blocks in wireless transceivers are filters, mixers, and amplifiers, all covered in a lecture by Brown Nauta later in Circuit Insights. These are the elements by which we control electrons. Passive elements, which do not require energy to operate, and active elements that require energy for their operation. A resistor resists the movement of electrons. A capacitor stores the electrons, as we said. This is equivalent of saying a capacitor integrates the current signal. An inductor integrates the voltage applied to it. And then there are the amazing transistors, NMOS and PMOS in which the gate voltage controls the current of electrons between source and drain. What is interesting about transistors is that they are tiny and that they can be used to build resistors, capacitors, and inductors. So all we really need for electronics are transistors. Let me put these together and walk you through the dance of electrons as they process information from left to right. This circuit is the well-known cascode configuration, where I have removed all the bias voltages just to focus on the small signal operation of the circuit. When you apply a voltage at this node, you are supplying electrons or withdrawing electrons from that node. These electrons or charge are integrated by the gate of the transistor, creating a voltage slightly different than VI. This voltage, in turn, will determine the electron current in M1. Part of this current is absorbed by this capacitor, and part of that will travel through the source of M2 towards the output node, which is further processed by the resistor and capacitor to form the output voltage. What is your role as a circuit designer here? You need to make sure the transistors are happy. They cooperate and stay in the right region. 
You need to make sure that the electrons follow your thought process. You need to make sure that electrons are at your service. We said we use electrons to store information, process information, and communicate information. But electronic circuits themselves have non-idealities, and we need circuit designers to devise ways to deal with these non-idealities. This slide shows four broad categories of non-idealities. These are parasitics, nonlinearity, variation, and noise. On the top left, you see that a transistor comes with parasitic capacitances, and they are known to slow us down. You will hear more about this from Professor Nan Soon later on. The transistors are generally nonlinear elements and can distort your signal. Professor Bezad Razavi will talk about the circuit techniques that is essential to reducing nonlinearity. No two transistors are the same, even if you intend them to be. In this example, we would love the two resistors to be identical and for the two transistors to be identical. But unfortunately, they will be different upon fabrication and that will affect the accuracy by which we can process information. Professor Kofi McKinwa has an excellent lecture on how to cope with variation later today. Finally, there is noise and other unwanted signals that we wish to filter out. The electrons that we love to control are also controlled by temperature. The higher the temperature, the more difficult it becomes for us to control electrons. Please stay tuned for the lecture by Professor Bram Nauta. These non-idealities provide great opportunities for your creativity and innovations. Here's a recap of what we have said so far. As a circuit designer, you sit at the center of the world I have pictured here. You need to understand electronic devices and how they behave. You need to devise ways of dealing with non-idealities with their process, voltage, and temperature variations. And you need to learn about the tools and techniques for design. Beyond this, depending on what you use electronics for, you need to act as an interface to a myriad of application areas, such as computer hardware, communications, systems control, quantum computers, photonics, machine learning and AI, and human health. Take your pick of these areas and bring your circuit techniques and innovations to them. Let me tell you how crucial your role is in this world. Without you, there would be no way for engineers working at the device level to directly communicate with engineers at any of these applications areas. You are the only one who understands the world below and the world above. And remember, given your strong background in math and physics, it is much easier for you to understand a problem in any of these application areas than for someone in those areas trying to understand and learn the art of circuit design. Let me use just one slide on quantum computers. Quantum computers are one of the next frontiers ahead of us, but this too is all about controlling electrons. Here we are interested in controlling the state of a quantum bit, or qubit for short. This qubit can be in the form of the spin of a single electron that we trap in a semiconductor well, or it can be the state of a current in a superconducting qubit as shown here on this example. To control the state of the qubit, we use classical electronics shown in red. To interrogate the qubit, that is to read the qubit, we use the building blocks shown in green. These building blocks are all classical electronics. These are analog to digital converters, digital to analog converters, low pass filters, VCOs, mixers, and amplifiers. What I would like to highlight here is that in the quantum world, we use charge of electrons to control and read 
the spin of a single electron carrying information. This brings me to the summary of my talk. We said electronics is the art of controlling electrons for the purpose of information storage, processing, and communication. We said to store information, we trap electrons on a floating gate or on a capacitor. And to process information, we use transistor circuits to manipulate electrons. And for this, we will see the lecture by Professor Mark Horowitz and Bram Nauta. We use electrons to communicate information, and that is to use circuits to create waves along a wire or through an antenna. To deal with non-idealities of the transistors, please see the lecture by Professor McKinwa and Sun. For examples of circuit techniques, please see the lecture by Professor Razavi. Circuit design for applications such as ML and AI are covered by Professor Verhulst, and human health is covered by Professor Gerald Yu. Here is a list of references and resources for further explorations. Circuit Intuition Series is written for undergraduate students. A Circuit for All Seasons and Analog Mind are written for graduate students and circuit designers in industry. There are many education videos on the SSCS YouTube channel and many more on the SSCS Resource Center. The Resource Center is for SSCS members and it includes over 200 hours of quality videos from ISSCC tutorials and short courses of the past 10 years. I hope you will take advantage of them. Thank you very much for your attention.